And I am really excited to uh, at, about our topic today of low vision resources. Um, this is something that I struggle with personally, but I know that a lot of our community members do and their clients do and sort of under, better understanding uh, eye health and uh, what some of the resources are out there is very important to all of us. So without further ado, I want to welcome our panel members to the stage. And uh, today we've got Dr. Alibi and Sean Curry from the Prevention of Blind Blindness Society of Metro Washington. Uh, welcome, you two. I'm delighted to have you today, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. But before we dive into these low vision resources, let's get to know the two of you a little bit better. Uh, Sean, how about we start with you? Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, the Prevention of Blindness Society for Metro Washington. Sure thing, Steve, and thank you again for having us on today. Uh, so yeah, my name is Sean Curry. I am our Director of Programs at the Prevention of Blindness Society of Metropolitan Washington. Uh, brief background on me, I'm originally from Pennsylvania. I've worked in uh, various healthcare settings from labs to health systems and now with uh, nonprofits. Uh, in particular, I work now at the Prevention of Blindness Society, and we are focused on the preservation of and the improvement of quality of life and your vision. And so our goals through our community programs is to make sure that folks don't lose sight, they don't have to lose, but vision loss that has happened, we're then focusing on how can we make the most of it and still do everyday things that you want to do. Uh, so we have various different programs uh, that do that. Concept. I love it. And, and speaking of programs here, before we meet Dr. Alba, I want to just bring up the uh, Prevention for Blindness Society website. And uh, I, I was on here the other day, and there are just a ton of resources and connections. But one thing that I want to make sure everybody knows is that, you know, today we're going to have a great discussion on, that will probably be pretty broad based in, in the topics that we discuss. But uh, just look at all these programs. Some are in person. Some are um, are 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 um, uh, Zoom and and digital that uh, that they offer here, as well as um, just a, a variety of programs and resources there. So um, the the youreyes.org website is a wealth of resources. I'll make sure to drop that in to chat for everybody. But the um, um, make sure you check it out. So um, and and so Sean, Dr. Alibi, who we're going to meet here. What uh, before we get to meet him, what role does Dr. Alibi play in the prevention of blindness um, society? Absolutely. So you're going to learn today a little bit about vision rehabilitation, and that's what Dr. Alibi specializes in. And we have our offices there. Um, at Alexandria in DC that he utilizes. And we work really heavily hand in hand to really provide that comprehensive care that is needed with people who are losing their sight. Excellent. All right. Well, Dr. Elby, um, I'm psyched to uh, introduce you to our community. Tell us a little bit about your background and um, what led you to this uh, career path. Well, thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here and nice to meet you all. I'm an optometrist and I went to optometry school in Houston, Texas. When I finished, I thought it'd be good to specialize. And this is how I ended up picking up low vision or vision rehabilitation as my specialty. So I spent another year at the Wilmer Eye Institute in Baltimore at their low vision rehabilitation center and specialized in this field of vision rehabilitation. Um, I came to the Metro DC area and started working with a very large retina practice to begin with and became very involved with the Prevention of Blindness Society because our goals and things that we are trying to achieve really do overlap a lot. So now I see patients in the facilities provided by the Prevention of Blindness Society. We host programs like this to bring awareness to the community about 
vision issues and how to deal with them. And um, I see patients and try to provide solutions and strategies to help them continue to be safe, independent. And majority of the people I work with are elderly because as uh, we age, we tend to be more prone to having vision issues. So this is a, this is a perfect setting for us to be having this discussion today. This, this is, and, and you know, I, uh, what I love about these discussions is that they're live and interactive and our community members never fail us with asking really great thought-provoking questions. And so I, I know we're gonna talk about the aging eye and, and sort of age-related uh, diseases and things of that nature, but since we've got a question that already came through the queue from Karen, Let's uh, let's see what we can do to help her. Um, Karen asks, any recommendations for progressive visual impairment associated with posterior cortical atrophy? And um, uh, I've never heard of that condition. Maybe you could share um, what that is. And are there some recommendations for someone like Karen? So actually, I'd need some clarification on that myself. Posterior cortical atrophy mm, doesn't come up as top of my list of things that typically affect older people. So maybe it's something else, or can she elaborate on what it is? And Okay. Um, uh, yeah, Karen, uh, just go ahead and drop in there any uh, conditions. I. I did a quick Google search. It's uh, posterior cortical atrophy. Benson syndrome is a rare condition that is considered a very, oh, wow, a variation of Alzheimer's disease. It's also known as visual variant, meaning it primarily affects an individual's vision and may impact cognitive function and progresses as well. Um, wow. Uh, well, she she notes it's a rare form of dementia. Okay, um, uh, I I think uh, Karen, uh, I definitely have a few resources that might be of help with that, and then possibly you know reaching out directly to Dr. Alibi. Um, but number one, thank you for sharing that with us. We talk about dementia and cognitive impairment on a weekly basis on these discussions. That's, yeah, that's an interesting one. I think you're right. That may require us to do a more one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction because I, I think the, the main ones we will come up with are things like macular degeneration and glaucoma and things like that, which is the majority of patients with uh, low vision who need vision rehabilitation. Okay, and then I'm dropping in this description that I found online into chat. A few people are asking about that and the uh, website that I found it from. Um, so, okay. Well, uh, thank you, Karen, for jumping in there. And I want to encourage everybody else to, um, to jump in. But let's, let's take a step back and let's sort of talk about what are the common age-related um, eye conditions that, that folks have, and what are some things that we need to know about that? Okay, that's, that's perfect. We all, ex we all are familiar with some of the common aging things we all experience. As we get older, we tend to hold things out further, and we have more difficulty with reading, and that's something that is universal. So there are some aging changes which are normal and natural and occur to all of us. And other than having to wear glasses, it's not as big a problem as some of the other things that we deal with in, in low vision and vision rehabilitation. So let's let I would like to make that distinction and that separation for the audience today is that, yes, there are normal aging changes, presbyopia, where we find we need reading glasses as we get older, there's that need for more light as we get older and we're finding re restaurants are far too romantic and why, why don't they use more lighting? Well, it's true. An 80 year old needs twice as much light as a, a 20 year old. And that's why as we get older, we tend not to like to drive at night as much. 
And there are things like dry eyes that seem to come about because again, like skin gets dry as we get older and our eyes get dry. So those are normal and natural aging changes, which you go and see your eye doctors and they give you some easy fixes and things you can take care of with. Then we have aging changes of the eyes, which are really diseases of the eyes, which really do need to be addressed. And people shouldn't just say, well, you know, I'm having trouble seeing now because I'm getting older and accept that that's just the way it is. There's no reason somebody who's even 100 years old shouldn't still have 20-20 vision. It's not like as we get older, we should, we should not be able to achieve 20-20 vision. But there are certain things that happen that may, may cause the vision not to be 2020, and we need to understand what's going on. So don't just say I'm older and I don't need to get an eye exam. It's just an aging change, but you may need to have an eye care provider take a look and make sure there's nothing going on which needs treatment. So what's the most common thing? I'm gonna just pick up the model of my eye here to try to try to demonstrate this. So if you think of the eye like a camera and a camera that's taking pictures, then the light's coming in from the front of the eye and it has a series of lenses that it goes through and then it focuses the image on the back of the eye. So the most common aging change most people know about are cataracts. So cataracts affect the lens in the eye. So here's the lens that's inside the eye. And as we get older, the lens becomes more yellow and that yellowing is what we call cataract. Well, we have a cure, we have a fix for that. There's cataract surgery. And I suppose many people have met people who've had cataract surgery and you know how successful that can be. So the lens in the eye is surgically removed and they replace it with one of these artificial lenses, which is called an implant. So that's one aging change that is very common, very typical. All of us, if we live long enough, would eventually develop cataracts. And you see your eye doctor, your eye care provider who guides you and tells you when is it appropriate now to have cataract surgery and they will do this procedure of replacing the lens in the eye. The most common reason people get changes to the eyes which are beyond just don't worry about it, it'll be okay, is something called macular degeneration. It's the leading cause of vision loss in the United States. So here we go, back to the eye, the lenses are in the front, the back of the eye, think of a camera. This is where the picture is made in the back of the eye and we call it the retina. In a camera, we would have called it the film, but here it is, the retina. And people have heard of things like retinal detachments where the retina peels away from the back of the eye and that requires surgical correction. That's not an aging issue, but that's something some people experience. The best part of this entire retina, this film that takes the picture, is a small area here called the macula, where we focus our images. One of the reasons we move our eyes is we use that part of the retina, the macula, to see detail. The ability to see 2020 on the eye chart is from the macula. The ability to read a street sign, to recognize a face, to thread a needle, to read a book etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. This is why our eyes move because we direct the macula to what we want to see. One of the most common aging issues is macular degeneration. And this is where there are changes in the macula, age-related changes, which affect that macula's capability of seeing fine detail. And it is progressive. So that's one of those conditions that you definitely need to have an eye doctor take a look and try to analyze the retina and the macula and to make sure there isn't macular degeneration. Now, I should, should clarify that there isn't a cure for macular degeneration like there is for cataracts, but the treatments do slow the process down. And this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure it doesn't get out of control and get worse. So some of the treatments for macular degeneration will help slow the process but it won't cure the process. So it is important that you're seen by your regular eye doctor for treatments for macular degeneration. Many of our patients, after they get macular degeneration, will say, you know, my glasses don't, don't work as well anymore. Maybe I just need to get a better, stronger pair. Well, there are no magic glasses that will fix 
the damage from macular degeneration. And this is when we start talking about low vision and finding other ways of compensating. And we'll get into some of those things as well. The other common aging issue is glaucoma. And people have heard of this word glaucoma. And glaucoma affects the nerve in the eye. So here we have our camera and it's connected to the brain. The pictures we take with our eyes are sent to the brain. And it's this cable, this optic nerve that's sending the picture to the brain. When you have glaucoma, the inside of the eye, which is filled with fluid, has too much pressure. And that pressure begins to damage the nerve. It's like putting a heavy piece of furniture on a wire and noticing your, your lights are flickering because the weight of the furniture is squeezing that wire. So in glaucoma, you have the same thing going on. The tricky thing about glaucoma is you don't feel it. If you had something heavy on your foot, you'd say, gosh, I can feel the pressure, but nobody can feel glaucoma. And because the pressure is so mild in the beginning, you can experience vision loss without realizing it. And that's why, again, we always emphasize at a certain point in, in your life, it's very important that you see an eye doctor annually and have them check the pressure in your eye and check for glaucoma because there won't be any symptoms initially. Having said that, some people, their glaucoma progresses to the point they do experience vision loss. And typically we think of loss of peripheral vision. and Again, this falls into the category of having low vision and needing vision rehabilitation. We need to find ways to make sure that despite the glaucoma, despite getting even treatments for the glaucoma, again, which won't cure it, won't fix the glaucoma, you should still be able to continue to function and continue your day-to-day -day activities. So this is where, again, we address strategies and tools, which we'll talk about, which can help ameliorate the impact of the glaucoma. The last yeah. one I'm going to touch on, Steve, and then I'm going to let you take over again, is diabetic retinopathy. That's another issue that affects the retina. And you can see this has small blood vessels. Diabetes can cause bleeding of those blood vessels. And again, those require treatments. Those treatments may not necessarily cure the diabetic retinopathy, but at least we stabilize the eyes. So I hope that gives you sort of an overview of these big conditions that we have to all watch out for as we get older that require more than I went to the drugstore to get my reading glasses now. Yeah, and and I'll tell you, like uh, a lot of people don't like going to the dentist and they they fear that, and which is why we have these... Uh, dentist that basically puts you under. For me, the glaucoma pressure test on my eye is the absolute, oh, it's so horrible. I can, it takes two people to hold my eyes open <laughs> so that they can do that. Um, the, uh, but I know, I know now how important that is. Um, all right, we got a bunch, your overview triggered a bunch of questions and topics. So let's just start jumping through these. And folks, if we can't answer one, we can do some research and get back to you. And also, folks in the community, share your stories. You may have some resources that could help some of the folks with some of the, the challenges that they're faced with. Um, Kathleen says, is there a, a per, is a person with macular degeneration eligible for a seeing eye dog? And does insurance cover that? Uh, you know, I've I have no clue how people get seeing eye dogs or qualify for them, or that's a great question. That is a great question. And so the, the, the first point is you wouldn't typically think of somebody with macular degeneration necessarily needing a seeing eye dog because in macular degeneration, it's really the central vision that's being impacted, the ability to see detail. Most people who use the seeing eye dog are losing peripheral vision. So the dog is guiding them with the edge of steps and curbs and crossing a street and not bumping into things. Now, having said that, it's not unreasonable that somebody who has very advanced macular degeneration may indeed feel un uncomfortable about walking around safely and want a seeing eye dog. 
well, here's how it works with seeing eye dogs. It's not something that's in the healthcare system. It's not a medical program to go and get a seeing eye dog, like getting a prosthesis for a knee or for a hip. And there are not-for-profit agencies that train and provide seeing eye dogs, which are provided for free. So it's not done through insurance because it's not part of the medical system, if you like. And in order to get a seeing eye dog, you have to apply. And these agencies have a very comprehensive application, which typically your eye doctor has to fill out. So when I recommend somebody go get a seeing eye dog, by this point, they're already using a white cane and using that for getting around and finding they need more. They need more ability to get around and the seeing eye dog gives them that greater level of independence. So a very detailed questionnaire is sent to your eye doctor, which asks these issues about why is this person needing a seeing eye dog? Do they use a cane to walk around? Is mobility an issue? Are they going to be good candidates for looking after a dog and so on and so forth? So it's quite a lengthy process um, and it's not done through the insurance. So I hope okay. that helps answer that question. And, and actually, I, I think service dogs would be a great discussion for us to have in the future. I, I found a nonprofit and I dropped a, um, uh, a good um, overview of how you get a service dog uh, into chat there for folks. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, Mrs. Honig says, what might be the cause of watery eyes indoors? So watery eyes, we typically think of dry eyes. Isn't that strange? You'd say, why am I, how could I have dry eyes when my eyes are watering? And that's because as I was going to go back to my model of the eye, the very front surface of the eye, which is called the cornea, is where light enters the eye first. And that lens, that front surface, that cornea is made up of cells like your skin. So as we get dry skin, we can get dry cornea. When the cornea is dry, it sends a message to the brain. It says, hey, my eyes are dry. My cornea is dry. And the brain turns on the faucets. It produces tears. It tries to lubricate the cornea. So dry eyes is caused because the cornea is dry. And it's not usually the watery component that, it, it, that eventually reduces that dry eye. It's actually an oily component. It's like having dry skin. If I said my skin is dry, I'll just put my hand under the tap of water for a few hours. I'll be fine. It doesn't work. I'm going to need a cream. I'm going to need some ointment. So in the same way, most people who have watery eyes have dry eyes because the little oil glands on the edge of their eyelids aren't producing that oil, that nice lubrication, and the cornea is dry. So the, the brain gets a message, the cornea is dry, produce tears, and it's trying to help, but doesn't resolve it. So that's makes one of the things. Yeah, it makes sense, but it is a little bit backwards where, yeah, uh, watery eyes are an indication of dry eyes. Uh, um, let's see, Judith, uh, and, and I think we need to get your model back on this one, is Judith says, help with severe astigmatism. I don't think you talked about astigmatism, um, but, but could you give Judith some guidance in that area? Sure, sure. So many of us who wear glasses, wear them for one of these three reasons. We have astigmatism, we are nearsighted or we're farsighted, right? Some people are none of those. You know, there are some people who say, I've never worn glasses, but when I got older, I needed reading glasses. Astigmatism really refers to the shape of the eye. So just like Steve says, I probably have to pull up the eyeball again. It's typically a perfect round spherical eyeball, but sometimes the eyeball is a little bit elongated. Think of it shaped like an egg rather than a perfect sphere. And it's that what we call astigmatism because when you have a normal healthy eye, you want light to focus properly on the back of the eye on the retina. But if you're nearsighted, it focuses in front of the retina if you're farsighted, it focuses behind the retina. 
which is why we're wearing glasses for nearsightedness or farsightedness. And if you have astigmatism, which you could have even if you're nearsighted or farsighted, it may fall into focus on some parts of the retina, but because of the unusual shape of the eye, astigmatism, some parts are in focus and some parts are not. So typically, people who have astigmatism, it's just like people who have nearsightedness or farsightedness. You have to get a proper prescription or contact lenses to compensate for that irregularity for the shape of the eye and make sure light is focused properly on the back of the eye again. So we don't think of that either as an aging issue or a, a disease of the eye, but just a shape of the eye issue. Now, um, I've been told, so this, so that if glasses were contacts, in her, she calls this uh, severe astigmatism, um, I believe some of the laser surgery it is one of the solutions that individuals have to correct astigmatism. Is that correct? So people get laser surgery because they want to do away with their glasses or contact lenses. Uh, and the laser surgery typically takes care of myopia being very nearsighted. But in the process, they will correct the astigmatism. And the laser surgery is occurring on the front surface of the eye. And so they're changing that front surface. Imagine carving a lens onto the front surface of the eye. So instead of having to wear the glasses, you're now carving that and you're compensating for the nearsightedness or, or, or astigmatism by, by doing laser. Some people after cataract surgery will say, you know, I had a lot of astigmatism and after cataract surgery, I don't even wear glasses anymore. So the same thing, remember I said, they remove the lens in the eye. Well, nowadays the lens they put back in, the artificial lens, the implant has your exact prescription in it. So they're oh. replacing the, the, the natural lens you were born with, but the lens they're putting in corrects the prescription astigmatism and nearsightedness and farsightedness as well. So, so, the, so that surgery, it, it, there's no correction of the changing shape no. uh, for astigmatism. It's only with that. So this, so, okay. So um, I guess that somebody with, with a severe change in that area where it's challenging to correct with glasses and with a lens and with the lens, um, are there some solutions or uh, directions that, that they may go in? So some people do, if they have, again, depends where that severe astigmatism is okay. coming from. I mentioned the shape of the eye. Some people have an unusual shape of the front of the eye, that cornea. That's typically also beautifully round and spherical like a basketball, but it might be that it's pointy like a football, like the front of a football then they would also have what we would call severe astigmatism. And for them, there are specialized contact lenses, for example, that compensate for that shape and create a new shape. So yeah. it's hard to know without exactly knowing what, what's the source of that severe astigmatism to suggest what would be the best solution for it. But if you do have severe astigmatism, these are very good questions for the for your eye doctors to say, well, is it something I can wear a specialized contact lens? Does it require laser? Like you said, can I do it with LASIK? Or do I need a lens exchange? What that cataract surgery is called is a lens exchange. Will that compensate for it? Okay, great. And, and you know, as somebody personally, I have a rare eye condition. I've been blind in one eye since birth. And I had a uh, surgery up at a, at the Wilmer Center that you referenced your training. And I was absolutely blown away at the level of, me of medical eye care at that center. It's almost like, like they want complicated and confusing conditions to walk in the door. And, uh, and so to the person that's asking about the severe astigmatism, you know, would, would you recommend 
getting multiple opinions and potentially seeing if you can schedule up there at Wilmer and have those doctors look at it. Absolutely, absolutely. We have very good doctors in this community. We, we're lucky to live in the Metro Washington, D.C. area. Uh, and many of those doctors who finish their training at the Wilmer Eye Institute, like me, end up in this area anyway. So I, I'm sure that if you bring this up with your regular eye doctor, and by all means, like you say, Steve, seek a second opinion. Yeah, know. yeah, I was blown away. And, uh, you know, uh, so, um, okay, let's get back on, on track here. We got tons of things, um, uh, tons of questions. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna jump between chat and Q&A. Cheryl says, I am very interested in compensating strategies for living with macular degeneration. Um, uh, can you uh, share, I, I've never heard that term, but I like it, compensating strategies. Perfect, and thank you, because that is really the focus of what Sean and I do. We are here about helping people find ways to compensate and to continue to live safely and independently. So I'm going to talk about a few things, and then, and I think this is a perfect way to segue to Sean as well. So when I'm when I see a patient with macular degeneration, and they've been told there are no more glasses that are going to improve your vision. Your vision is no longer 2020. And you, the patient with macular degeneration comes to me and says, I'm now having trouble reading. I'm worried about whether I can continue to live independently in my home. I'm having trouble driving. I'm not sure it's safe for me to drive. I want to use my computer. I want to continue sewing. What am I going to do? How am I going to live with this? Because I know the medical treatment isn't going to cure me. They're doing whatever they can to make sure it doesn't get worse, but I'm still in this situation of being visually impaired or low vision. From my standpoint, there are three simple things we focus on. Ways to improve lighting, ways to improve contrast. Contrast just means how much more black and white can we make things and make things easier to see, and then different forms of magnification. Typically, people with macular degeneration respond best to these three things, improved lighting, improved contrast, and some ways of magnifying. Early on, it could be the simplest way to do all this is to have a lighted magnifier and many of my patients have already come in and they've brought in their little magnifying glass that they're using, and they're using that to read their mail and bills and writing checks and so on and so forth. That's a great start. We have far more sophisticated things. We even use electronic magnifiers. These are video magnifiers that do the same thing, but they increase contrast, they enhance contrast. And we do take advantage of resources in the community, things like talking books, because for many people, they can still read with macular degeneration, but they'll say, I find I read so slowly, I just don't enjoy it anymore. Or if I have to read this paper, I get through the first paragraph and it's, I'm working so hard to see now to read that it's exhausting. So we'll say, okay, let's take advantage of the Washington ear, where they read the newspaper out to you. You can dial in and just choose the section you want read to you. Why don't we sign you up for the talking books from the Library of Congress? And they will send you books on tape or a special app on your phone that you can just listen to all these books. There are also community resources that come to you. So Sean, I'm going to segue to you here because you run the low vision resource centers that the prevention of blindness has and that that gives people a lot of information about these resources so steve if it's okay with you i'm gonna i'm gonna punt to sean oh, no no this is great because um and i really uh yeah it's it you know doing everything we can medically but then also tapping into these resources to improve our quality of life Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, like Dr. Alibi mentioned, you know, by the time we're seeing folks, they already likely have an eye condition and we've made the most we can medically to make that site as best as possible. Now, what can we do now to still do the things we want to do? 
And that could be improving your site through magnification, lighting and contrast, but also there's other ways such as using your other senses or um, using different strategies and working with people or with services to still do the things you wanna do. This ranges from transportation. That's a huge one we get. Uh, transportation from how do I get to my doctor's office to how do I fly to California? Uh, and those are two very different things, but there's resources for all of that and services for all of that. Additionally, what we do, anytime we have somebody come in, we want to focus on, you know, what are your top three issues that you're having or what are three activities that you want to do again? Now, oftentimes people say driving. Well, we let them know, you know, driving, that might be a little out of our hands, but there are transportation things that you can do. Uh, the other piece, though, is we learn very quickly where people's visions at just by having a conversation with them. Uh, it's it's very easy to tell whenever there's trying to use magnification. OK, we have our magnification at 6x and they're still reading extraordinarily slow. That means we may need to start talking about using other senses like our sense of hearing or other services uh, because we want to make sure we make the most and uh, make sure that what they're trying to do is still enjoyable. There is nothing enjoyable trying to struggle to read two or three words a minute with a book when you can listen to it. And sometimes you can listen to it faster than you can read it, too. Uh, so there's all kinds of things that's out there. And we really work with the client one on one to figure out what are we trying to do and um, really also what's important to you, because there's going to be different things for every different person. And we do that through our resource center as well as our resource and support group network. And we really are engaging people to try to make sure, one, that we can help you, but also get you connected with other people that are experiencing these vision issues. That's so important. Most people, when we see them, they come through our doors, they'll tell us, I've never met another blind person before. And our response often is, you, may, you probably have, you just didn't realize it because it's difficult to tell. And also, if you get connected with folks that have other vision issues, you learn solutions that you're not going to read about in the book because every, every uh, situation is going to be different. I love it. All right. Let's um, get keep on going through some of these questions and comments. Uh, they're great. Wendy says, do you recommend laser treatment of, the, of nerve thinning in glaucoma and at what stage and in indication is this urgent? Wow. So, Wendy, you've asked me a very specific technical question. You know, everybody is different, even though the disease name is the same, right? We've talked about macular degeneration, glaucoma, and I can tell you, everyone is impacted differently, both in terms of how the disease process affects your eyes and the best approaches for treatment. These types of very specific questions really are addressed by the specialist. You know, a glaucoma specialist is the best person to truly be able to analyze and determine what's the best approach to reduce the pressure. And they have different tools and strategies that they're using to reduce that pressure and keep things under control. So at our end, what Sean and I really do is to say, okay, you've been to your glaucoma specialist, they're doing all these things and they're telling you, they're trying to keep things under control, but you're still having difficulties functioning. And how are we gonna help you continue to function despite the changes? But the specific treatment I think is best addressed with your specialist because they know your eyes much better. They know what they've already done and tried, and they're going to continue to guide you and help you to determine, okay, what's the best approach? And like Steve said, if sometimes you feel I'm still not satisfied with this approach, that's when you go to the second opinions and try to find out, okay, is there a better way to treat the condition? But you'll always come back to us to help you function with the condition, regardless of what the treatment is or the outcome is. I, I love it. And I, um, I can. And for folks that might be out there who have, like, I, I mean, this sounds intimidating. I know if somebody told me that, I'd be like, "Holy cow! I, I need more resources." Are does um, does your organization help people find um, 
other specialists that they might get those second opinions if they don't have any connections? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the answer is yes, but before I go more into that, I'd also challenge, you know, we have so many questions in the, in the chat box that are specific to your eye issue. Write these questions down and bring them with you to your next exam. Doctors love that. I've even heard people, they still fax. And, you know, not that many people have faxes anymore, but doctor's offices do. Fax them your questions. It's like a test for them and they love taking tests. So they will be more than happy to answer those questions. Well, and, and piggybacking on that actually is one of, the, one of the changes that's occurred with the pandemic and the prevalence of telemedicine, which is, you know, or, or um, digital health or what have you, Think about the challenge that a doctor goes through. Yes, they do like tests, but most of the time that door opens. If you have an office appointment, that door opens, you hit them with this question. All they have is a notebook in their hand. Um, one of the things that I've heard a lot of doctors say is that if I can have a week or so to do a little bit of research so that when you come through that door, I can give you some of the research that I've done uh, it, it's amazing. And that can really help out. And, and Sean, great suggestion, not just for this folks, but for all health conditions. Um, my dad was in the hospital for an extended period of stay and he found him repeating the same thing over and over to this revolving door of healthcare professionals that walked in and he had my mom type out everything and print out copies and hand it to the people and now it's in writing and they could react to it. So great suggestion there. Um, okay, should we get back on, on, on here? Um, holy, holy cow. Um, any tips on ptosis, eyelid drooping, regarding things to consider, vetting doctors for the surgery, various surgery techniques, doing one eye or both. Also, does potential double vision, potential adult crossed eyes, dry eyes, um, is that a complication with this procedure? Gosh, again, Steve. A this very, is specialized, yeah. Yeah, very technical question, um, very specific. It's gonna be different for everyone. I would, I, I would hate to say something so general with just a question like that, but and, very nice questions. Well, I, I, what I like about these questions, and it's, I, I, folks, recognize we're having a discussion on eyes, okay? And and things that are very specialized, like having surgery on your eyelid, those need to dive deeper. However, what I like about these questions coming through, I never knew that that existed. Like I'm learning things from your all's questions and it's, and, and we may have loved ones in the audience that are like, oh yeah, my my loved ones, I drew, eyelid droops. I never thought about, um, you know, talking. I thought that was just natural or whatever. Um, okay, Michelle asks, are A-R-E-D-S supplements useful? Um, and and what are uh, A-R-E-D-S uh, supplements? All right, so A-R-E-D-S, age-related eye disease study that was done by the National Eye Institute to show the health vitamins, specific vitamins may, may give to people with macular degeneration. So again, your retina specialist, your regular eye doctor, perhaps even who has diagnosed you with macular degeneration will be able to say to you, based on this ARED study done by the National Eye Institute, there were certain stages of macular degeneration, there we go, that really benefited from these vitamins. And these vitamins are commonly available from the drugstore. Even your eye doctors can have versions of these. And definitely, if your eye doctor recommends them, because based on that study at that stage of macular degeneration, it's worth taking them. So again, I'm going to preface this, Steve, and say, these are things you're doing to slow the condition down, to hopefully not let it get worse but there are still consequences to having macular degeneration, which is why you're saying, I wish I could do something to make things better. But those things that you're having trouble doing is what we, Sean and I, really work with you on 
trying to figure out, okay, while you take your vitamins, what else can we do to make it easier for you to function and do the things you need to do in day-to-day -day life? And um, that's yep. really where we focus oh, our- Oh yeah, no, this is great. And it's reiterating that. Now, uh, I will say Betty uh, has a great question. How do I go about making an appointment with the doctor? So uh, um, uh, how, do, do you have a private practice where people could actually make appointments with you? So yes, that's right. Usually I see patients that are referred to me. So your retina specialist, your glaucoma specialist, your cataract surgeon might say to you, you know, I've done everything medically to keep things under control and I have it at a stage where I'm on, I've got it under control, but I recognize that your vision isn't normal and you're still having difficulties. So it's time to make an appointment with a low vision specialist. Someone like myself just does low vision. I just work with people who have a diagnosed disease who are now having difficulties with their day-to-day -day activities and I work out of the offices of the Prevention of Blindness Society, and we have a, a scheduling system and you're scheduled to see me and we spend an hour together and so on and so forth. So please ask your regular provider, eye care provider and say, has my vision reached the point now where you're not able to help me with glasses and you're doing everything medically possible, but I'm still not seeing things as well as I need to that I can be referred to a low vision specialist, someone like myself. And there are many eye doctors who provide low vision in their own practices, maybe not on a daily basis like I do with working with the Prevention of Blindness Society, but maybe once a week or once a month, they do it in their own offices. So again, this is where Shimon was saying, you must ask your, your doctors and remind them and say, hey, thanks for all the help you're giving me, but I, I still need more help. Where do I go for this help? Okay, great. All right. What I'm going to do, we've got, I'm going to scan some of the questions and I'm going to try to address the ones that are less technical because I know we can go down some rabbit holes and that's not discounting any of these questions, but I have a funny feeling when I go through these that some of them are going to be look, you got to talk to your specialist, okay? But but I want to address every question that we got in the queue. Um, but but this, Missy has one that I think that's a, a pretty good one here. How can we assess and compensate when, when and bifocal lens are no longer effective for a person with visual processing due to dementia? Mm. So, um, that's, that's a really interesting one. And I could see where that, that could occur. Um, uh, have, have you encountered that? And are there some strategies for somebody that might be confused about the bifocals? Yeah, no, it's a, that's a very good question, actually, Steve. And, and I appreciate that because it's true. When we think of ways we use our eyes and the tools we use like glasses, we have to even make an adjustment for that. For those of us who just go and have an eye exam and they say, here's a new prescription, you know that we put, put our new glasses on and go, oh my gosh, it's gonna take me a little bit of getting used to this, even when everything is perfect, right? So imagine now having a visual impairment or having dementia and having to now adjust to something where you put them on, you go, oh, I don't know if this is helpful or it's exacerbating the problems I'm having. So for example, with the bifocal, we know there have been many studies that have shown that people often get confused when they look down and they're, they're walking between the top of the lens and the bifocal, the reading part, and can often fall. So many times I see patients and I'll take that into consideration and say, you know, you brought your father in, he has dementia, he has macular degeneration. I can see he's having some difficulties walking and things now. Why don't we switch him out of bifocals perhaps and think about a pair of glasses for walking around with and a pair of glasses for reading and put little markers on them or make the glasses so different that 
even for somebody who's with him, a caretaker or a loved one would say, hey, dad, you got the wrong glasses on. Remember, put the other ones on. So these are issues that come up a lot during a low vision evaluation where we address these kinds of things and say, okay, what's a better way? Even if we're just going to say, use glasses, what's a better way of doing this rather than bifocals or progressive lenses? So perfectly good question, very legitimate. Some of these things, maybe your regular eye doctor would address, but if not, it's going to happen in the low vision evaluation for sure. Okay. Um, I, I've gleaned all the, uh, the questions there and I found one uh, common theme that I think that I, would be great for you to address that Joan and, and, um, and Deborah and several others, and that's talking about technology and assistive technology that can support uh, folks um, uh, in, with vision loss. Care Perfect. to comment Perfect. on those? Perfect question. And so, Sean, do you want to talk about some of this? Because you have a lot of that assistive technology at the Low Vision Resource Centers. And I'm often telling patients, you know, you now need to sit down with somebody who can go through some of this technology. I know what you need. I'm going to tell them what things you should look at. And go ahead, Sean. Sure thing. Yeah. So, Somebody comes to us and assistive technology, first off, it plays a huge role nowadays in a lot of what uh, can be done. And the technology is getting better. I mean, every single year I've been with POB for five years. What was there five years ago versus what's here now is almost night and day. So it is evolving very fast. But what's important is we want to find the piece of technology or the pieces of technology that work for you. And it's going to differ for every person based on what their condition is, what their lifestyle is, what their um, age is. It can all vary quite a bit. The good news, though, is that there's something for everyone. This could range from these artificial intelligence piece that you put on your glasses, and they can be very, very um, helpful for identifying things. They kind of use that in the place of your vision. That's like the high end. And then there's low end stuff from as simple as something like little bump dots that you can put on your microwave or your oven to be able to still cook at home and also other contrasts and whatnot to even things like your smartphone here. And I'm just going to touch really briefly. This smartphone is one of the most powerful pieces of technology that you can have. Um, I, and we find 80, 90, 100 year olds coming in with smartphones and they're using them fine. On here, there's all kinds of accessibility uh, things from your magnifiers. There, like if the electronic magnifiers that Dr. Alibi was talking about earlier, there's actually one of those on your phone. And if you have a phone that's like a 10 or newer, um, it's pretty comparable to a lot of what's out there. Um, downsides, screen's not as big, of course, but that tool is so powerful for what people want to do day in and day out. The other thing too is there's apps for everything. And a lot of them are free too. So there's apps for reading your books. There's apps for using artificial intelligence. There's magnifying apps. There's currency readers. Uh, there's pretty much everything under the moon. And, so, and, and yeah. you know, a piece of technology that I've heard a lot of people with low vision using very successfully is the voice activated technology, Amazon Alexa and uh, Google Home and those devices. Yeah, and it's that's another one we've had a tech talk on the Amazon I'm not going to say your name because I have it in the background here, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, you can get pretty much anything you know, from recipes to knowing the time to knowing what your travel is going to be like. You can even make calls and texts through your for, through that device if it's you can get it hooked up to your phone. Uh, and the nice thing, too, about those pieces of technology is you can get like the dot, which is this little small one. You can get them for like 20 bucks and burn, uh, put them black. in every room. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and uh, I'm sure there's quite a few folks on here that have a grandchild or a son or daughter. I'm sure they would be happy to help set them up. It's a great activity to do with your grandkids uh, because it gets them engaged and they get to teach you something, which is exciting for both parties. Now, um, and and obviously, like the the best way to sort of evaluate assistive technology and technology in general reaching out to your organization and do you all do sort of a one-on-one -on -one with folks if they're interested in this? Yeah, we'll work with them one-on-one -on -one to figure out, you know, what's the best thing for you? 
There are also other uh, service professionals out there, such as occupational therapists, uh, who can come into your home. That's something we personally can't do. But okay. an occupational therapist, they can come into your home. And we're really focusing on safety because you want to be safe in your own home. But all of a sudden, if you can't see the ground or it's certain things in the kitchen or in the bathroom, that can create some safety issues. And they can work with you one-on-one -on -one to make that home uh, safe and sound. And also what's nice is that is covered under Medicare. So uh, that's okay. an encouraging piece too. Great. And another theme, several questions asking about, I mean, we have grown to a national audience. Uh, and uh, although most of our audience is in the Mid-Atlantic and DC metro area that, that your name services, but are there national organizations or regional organizations like yours that folks can tap into? Absolutely, yeah. So first, I, I'd say that, you know, we have all these resources and services. We serve the D.C. metro community. A lot of the stuff, though, is available nationally, like talking books or the technologies and whatnot. But if you're looking for your specific, you know, where do I find my doctor alibi if I live in Delaware, say? There's uh, a couple great places to find these organizations. One's called the Vision Serve Alliance. And that's vision, wait, that's the Vision Serve Alliance, VSA. They are a conglomerate of many of the organizations that do these kinds of vision rehab services and blindness rehab and whatnot. Uh, and they are a very extensive group. There's over 100 of uh, groups that are a part of it. That's a really great resource to try to find um, a group in your area if you're outside. The other one I'd say is Vision Aware, and I see uh, Sharon, uh, you're ahead of me here. Uh, VisionAware.org also has quite a bit available, and they also are a really great resource to be able to um, learn about different ways to still do different activities and whatnot. Okay, great. Um, and let's see, we're going to put both of those in the uh, chat for everybody. Uh, that's great. All right. I see it's the top of the hour. We still got um, a bunch of comments that we may or may not be able to address in any kind of reasonable, uh, you know, way. Some are very technical, but are you all okay hanging on for a few minutes and we'll try to get through a few more of these. And then folks, if you need to jump off, remember this is recorded so you can come back and, and sort of respond to what we are doing. And Robert, yes, we will give you a copy of the chat. Um, one of the things we were talking about uh, guide dogs and uh, I was glad to see in here that we actually have somebody who has a guide dog and she is willing, uh, Carol Edwards, I would be willing to talk about my experience applying for a guide dog and using a guide dog every day, living with a guide dog. So Carol, I'm gonna take you up on that. Um, if I don't email you, you email me. That's gonna be a really cool discussion that we can have. Um, and Steve, but, one, one quick point I just want to add before we move on to some of the more specific questions. Yeah. Um, there's also go uh, government agencies in each jurisdiction that have services such as orientation and mobility training. Uh, they can help get you connected with occupational therapy, vocational rehabs. So that's folks that want to go back to work, as well as independent living. So each state has their own agency that has those sorts of services. Um, and they are a really great resource for people, too, because they can help you get things that maybe your insurance doesn't cover. They may be able to help you out with public funding. So that's another piece of the pie. Um, and I think we're starting to kind of see, you know, there's a big pie when it comes to all the things that's there. That's another big piece that a lot of folks would be interested in knowing about. OK, great. Uh, all right. Let's see. Kathleen says, if someone has blurry vision, some days worse than others, like flare ups, but no physical cause like cataracts, could it be due to medications or something like inflammation? And, and again, if you can't answer this, doctor, just, yeah. you know, standard line. But if you've yeah. got any insights, let's try to help these folks out. Yeah, no, it, it's 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 good that people ask these questions and they must ask their eye care provider these questions. So typically people with dry eyes would have that experience too. You know, when the eyes are dry, their vision will be worse. It, it, it'll fluctuate like that as well. So there, there can be other causes. Medications cause dry eyes, you know? So people take certain medications, causes very dry eyes and their vision fluctuates. 
So all of these are very worth exploring. And I think, Sean, you put it well to bring up these questions with your eye doctors. You know, typically you don't have much time and the doctors are rushing in and out, but if you can hand them a piece of paper ahead of time and say, you know, I'll, I'd like to make sure I have these addressed, um, then I think they're very good, reasonable questions to and, ask. And you know, you bring up something, uh, 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 shoot, what was her name? Kathleen and the doctor on medications. It's like, think about how many times you go into a doctor's office. Again, it's a limited amount of time. They're asking you a few questions. The doctor may or may not put two and two together that you're on some medications that could be causing something. So, you know, a great thing for all of us to do, especially those with multiple prescriptions, is always have a list of all the medications you're taking. It's great to have no matter what, especially if you landed in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that could open the, the doors up or allow a doctor to do some research to find that this is a uh, side effect of your medication. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Sarah asks, is there a need for more light related conditions besides cataracts? Um, so yeah, that, great question. I mean, we've got the aging eye and we've got cataracts, but, but the increasing our light, is it, is that all cataracts or is that, uh, uh, uh something else? Well, all of these conditions we've talked about, we will find that people need more light. People with macular degeneration definitely need more light to see things. People with glaucoma need more light to see things. And that's because many of these conditions cause loss of contrast. You know, behind me is an eye chart, which is black on white, but everything we see in life isn't like the eye chart. You know, when we're looking at mashed potatoes on a white plate, well, the potatoes might be big enough to see, but if we've lost something called contrast sensitivity, then it's harder to see things like the edge of steps and curbs and things because we've lost contrast. And all of these conditions, cataracts, macular degeneration, glaucoma, impact contrast sensitivity. So having lighting and positioning the lighting appropriately is one of those things we explore. Lighting, contrast, and magnification. Those are the three key things that during low vision evaluations, we always explore and we do it with each individual and try to figure out what's best for you. Yeah, no, and, and again, an occupational therapist, a uh, aging in place specialist that can remodel, you know, oftentimes we decorated our homes back in when we were 20 years old. And, uh, you know, the, the difference between being in a well-lighted as opposed to a mood lighting uh, for our safety and our function is huge. Um, okay, really technical one, but I want to bring it up. What are the concerns of progressive supranuclear palsy? It's a progressive Parkinson's disease that often is mixed up, diagnosed as Parkinson's or Alzheimer's due to overlap. And, you know, we've had several questions that are diving into conditions that are more cognitive and neurological that could impact vision, but they're, so you can see in some cases where you need your ophthalmologist and your neurologist working together because the brain and the eye are very Absolutely. closely aligned. Absolutely, Steve. I think you hit it on the head that we, we have to always remember the eyes are part of the brain. They're part of the neural system, right? We tend to think of the body, the skeletal system, bones, the integumentary system, the skin, the digestive system. Well, eyes fall into the neurological part of things. So it is true. When I sit with a patient, oftentimes I have to ask myself the same questions is, is this experience the patient having right now just because they have macular degeneration, or perhaps there is more going on and we have to factor that in to what we're going to do in terms of helping this person, like Sean says, stay safe and independent and be able to do things. And, and it becomes very complex. That's why it takes a village here. It takes all of these resources and specialists 
to kind of work together to find solutions because it's not as simple as saying put these glasses on and everything will be fine again mm -hmm. um okay i know we're we're running out of time here let me see if i can find a few more um uh that that would be appropriate uh suzanne says i know people who have one far-sighted lens and another eye has nearsighted lens can, can anybody do this why do folks do this it's uh -oh. called monovision it's called okay. monovision and the 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 reason they sometimes do this is because they don't want to wear glasses and if you can have one eye that can see distance far-sighted eye and one eye that can see near then they don't need to wear glasses because one, the one eye will do the reading and the other eye will do the seeing at a distance so that's something that either people have tried before when they were younger and they wore contact lenses they could have one lens that's set for distance and one set for near and sometimes people after cataract surgery can have that discussion with their cataract surgeon and say you know would it be possible to have one eye for distance, one eye for near? So it's really, if it's something that you've done and tried before and it's worked for you and it's convenient, then you have something like that done. It's called monovision, but it's it's definitely not for everyone. Okay. Now, this is one that I know that you can address. Allison says, is there home therapy for somebody who is newly blind? And Sean, you alluded to an occupational therapist. And I, I think that a lot of times we don't think about occupational therapists as a resource when we're losing our vision, but really uh, what a great resource to help somebody navigate their life um, and their home uh, with this slowly progressing condition. Can, can you speak on that? Sure thing. Yeah. And uh, I should also mention that OTs that I'm talking about, they've also done specific training um, or have a certain uh, certification to be considered low vision OT. So it's not, you know, the hand therapy OT. They could help out with some things, but there's people that get specific training to do the low vision side of things. Um, but yeah, it, they work very hand in hand for uh, safety in the home. Now, for some, if you're looking for the vision rehabilitation piece that Dr. Alibi does um, with the medical side of things, I think, I believe there's one and they serve in Virginia area that will go into the home. And then there's some other ones that are here and there, but um, it's a little rare for folks to come for like someone like a Dr. Alibi to come into the home, but it does exist as well. Okay. I've got, I've got uh, one that I really want to address here. And this is somebody who says, Will you be able to help me convince motor vehicles that I can drive? I'm confident <laughs> I can drive. Now, one thing that I'm going to throw in there to the person that asked that question is a comment that was in chat. Uh, there is, in Virginia, there is a driver's rehab center, and um, they have the ability to test people and, um, and determine whether it's safe if you can drive, it, and if not, help rehab you if that is if there is potential there. But we've done several discussions on giving up the car keys. And one thing that I just, and again, I'm not saying that this is your situation exclusively, is this is where you've got to, you've got to stop thinking selfishly. If it's not safe for you to drive, you're putting small children and the world at danger. And um and I would recommend, you know, connecting with a rehab center and make a very objective evaluation and also recognize that the world has changed. Okay, you don't need to take a taxi cab everywhere. There are Uber, Lyft, and a wide variety of ways that we can get around now with, without a car. Any thoughts on driving and vision and, and what have you? So Steve, that's one of the most common things we deal with in this field of low vision. And I, I'd like to clarify something for all, everybody on the call today is that there is laws that define who's legal to drive. So it's not just 
am I safe to drive, but am I legal to drive? And this is where we often run into these issues because I'll see patients who I feel are safe to drive, meaning despite the fact that they don't have 20-20 vision, despite the fact they have macular degeneration or whatever, cataracts, whatever it might be, I may still feel that, you know what? They're still seeing well enough, they're safe to drive, but they may not meet the legal requirements for driving. And that's because every state, every jurisdiction, and here in DC, Maryland, Virginia, each jurisdiction has its own rules. So if you don't meet those rules, those laws, then you might say, and I might say, I think you're safe to drive, but you're not legal to drive, then you're not supposed to drive. On the other hand, there may be people who are still legal to drive, meaning they can put their head in the machine and still read all the letters, but they're no longer safe to drive. Maybe like we've discussed today, they have other issues, could be dementia, could be cognitive issues. So they'll bring the forms in and say, please sign my vision form so I can get my driver's license renewed. And they pass, they're legal, but they may not be safe to drive anymore. So this, this is an issue that really, you, you brought it up beautifully, Steve. Somebody needs to assess both ends of this. Sometimes somebody is legal to drive, but maybe they're not safe to drive. Maybe there are other issues beyond the vision which don't make them safe to drive, and in which case you're right. You, you need to be honest and say, it's not just because I need to get to the grocery store, but what's, what's in the best interest of the public here that yeah. we don't jeopardize. And that's, it's else. tough to, because especially if you live in a car dependent neighborhood and you've grown up that way, it's, it's very difficult to make those transitions. We don't discount that at all. Um, holy cow. I think, you know, what this discussion has basically told me is we've got to do these more often and maybe I'll, I'll meet with you two and, and, and other people that are on this discussion that have vision ideas for a discussion. But I think this has been a great broad overview. I think what it tells me is we might get more specific on um, some different uh, things. And like how OT, I, I'm personally curious about how OTs can help us with low vision uh, and, and, and other 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 things, but this has been fantastic. I, I want to give you both just the opportunity to kind of close things out. I want to apologize to anybody who I didn't get to your question. I tried to get to almost all of them, but I know there's a ton in there, but the whole transcript will be available at the, with the recording. Well, I, I'll just say, remember, some aging issues are normal, and that's fine. Some aging issues require you to see your eye care provider and undergo treatment. But even if it doesn't fix it, don't give up on that treatment because you don't want things to get worse. And lastly, reach out for things to help you. This is what Sean and I have hopefully tried to, to, to give up the message that even if there isn't going to be a fix or a cure, at least we can find a workaround and find other ways to make sure you're safe, you're independent, you can get to your grocery store and you don't become depressed and isolated sitting in your homes. Uh, the one thing, I'm glad you brought that up because COVID has made an open dialogue on, the, on how unhealthy loneliness and isolation can be and a few weeks ago, we had a discussion on hearing loss and how that can be lonely and isolating. And vision loss is the same. And uh, there, I, I think we know that there's some resources out there that can help people with that. Sean, any closing thoughts? And uh, and then I'll 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 call to uh, do another discussion on this topic. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I, I want to end by saying, you know, vision loss, that's not the end of the world. It's not a death sentence. There's still a ton that you can do. Uh, and it's a great opportunity to learn a lot of new things too, which is an exciting thing to do as we age. Excellent. 
All right, folks. Well, I'm going to get this recording up as soon as I possibly can. It'll have contact information for both uh, Dr. Alibi and Sean. And I want to thank you too, but I really want to thank the audience with some amazing thought-provoking questions that helped us uh, have a wonderful discussion today. And uh, we'll see you at the next uh, discussion. <laughs> thank you, everyone. It was great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.